Okay, I think I have just turned on the audio recorder. So, welcome to my desk. This is several things all rolled into one. First, this is a catastrophe. This is a mess. I make no pretense in this particular setting. I am a hunter and a gatherer. I am an explorer, I am curious, um, and I'm messy sometimes. As it turns out, explosions don't box themselves up. Explosions don't wrap themselves in gift paper with bows. Explosions explode. And there's a, there's a bit of, I would say, uh, ADHD kind of stuff going on here. My life has been a, a, a pretty regular um, struggle, although for me it, it's the norm, so it doesn't, it, it doesn't read experientially to me like struggle. But struggle, um, wrestling with the bear that is the unknown, flying at me from every direction at all times. I'm toying around with this as another YouTube look. I don't know how interesting that is to anyone else. I woke up this morning with a fair bit of clarity about something that I've been struggling with lately. And so I'll make that the talking point of this sort of practice run of talking at my desk. I knew when I started YouTube that the sort of prescribed rules of success if you wanted to be successful. And just to pause real quickly, when I talk about being successful on YouTube, there are different measures by which you can say I'm successful or not. Uh, several of those different metrics matter to me for totally different reasons, and in some cases they conflict with one another. So to be on YouTube in the first place, I knew that it was going to be an extraordinary amount of work not just the um, filming of a video or just the editing of a video, but setting it up, coming up with the ideas and the writing really, I felt was gonna be the more um, involved piece. And in fact, it, it certainly has, has been every bit as daunting as I thought it might be. Nevertheless, I thought, you know, going onto YouTube, I think it's easy for someone of any kind uh, with any level of interest in any particular thing at all to say I want to go on YouTube because someday I would like to be able to monetize that make some money from that so to say that is probably a given um, in so far as anything that requires a great deal of effort and expense to do I think it's at, at the very least it's important to consider what what's an appropriate return on that investment? How much do I have to get back to say that all the effort and all the expense and all the pain and struggle and all that goes into making this thing is worth it? Um, to me, it's sort of obvious. It sort of goes without saying. It's kind of just implied for a person to say, well, I would love to be on YouTube and that it's going to replace my income. But I don't think it's particularly interesting or creative, um, really not interesting at all for someone to respond to, why do you want to be on YouTube with the answer, because I want to make a lot of money. It's that's sort of like in a way, not really at all, but I'm going to compare it to asking someone, why do you, um, why do you play the lottery? Um, well, I want to win. Well, okay, yeah. Is there any other part of that experience which proves worth, you know, the investment of a buck or however much you spend on tickets, 10 bucks, 100 bucks, I don't know. Uh, so for me, I had to look at the YouTube question from like, what's the bare minimum takeaway? What's the least that I could accomplish which would still make all the effort worth it? And for me... I, I have landed, and I landed before I started, I landed on the answer, which is if I could leave some of my thinking, some of my ideas, some of my process, 
some of the way that I am, if I could leave that in a place where it's at least minimally useful to my own children, grandchildren, and future offspring, like maybe they're very far into the future, I'm long gone, and they're looking back, and maybe it's not my wisdom that's helpful, but instead it's this uh, it's this texture um, of what it was like at this moment in history that they're able to sort of like see through to history in a more colorful and um, uh, I don't know f- just flavorful way so it's legacy territory that's I mean to just kind of dumb it down that's my minimum entry point is I want to do something that at the very minimum provides some sort of legacy value to my kids and you know future family members so Knowing all of that going in, um, feeling kind of both ends of the possibility, the, the, the tall end being, hey, this does very well and maybe it gets to be my only job and I can pay my you know, mortgage and pay off my debts with this as an income stream. Maybe it's that, you know, it's, it's nice like that or, or maybe it's just at minimum, it's something that my family can look back on and be grateful to have. So those are enough reasons to do it. Um, but then, you know, as I was saying, some of the rules for succeeding in YouTube space with now we're going back to why was I talking about succeeding? Succeeding here in this case being, um, you know, it's worth the effort. And so if I can succeed by hitting either of those two measures, one is the financial measure, which I am nowhere even close to right now, but I'm already nailing the low bar, which is leave stuff for my family already nailing that but to succeed at the high bar to get into that territory where you might be making you know income from something like this uh, there are certain sort of rules Um, I I could say they're unwritten but in some places they're written Um, but there are certain established principles uh, one being for example how often you should create content yeah I'd love to deliver every day But I know for a fact that I'm not going to be able to deliver every day. Well, I say that. As soon as I said that, this part of my brain goes, no, I mean, maybe. I mean, if it's this kind of stuff, if it's just me rambling, I could maybe do that every day. But I can't imagine that this holds enough value. Anyway... So I, I kind of came in and I started, uh, you know, ideating different quality levels. So I started, I, I've got that studio look. You can actually see behind me a, a peak of that area where I do the studio work. This over here is the desk behind the camera. You can see the camera right there. But when I started out, because I, I come from a professional television and film background, it was very important to me right out of the gate at the very top of all of this that I had a, a, a refined, developed, polished look that was locked in. And so you have that studio look. But then I, I quickly um, confirmed what I suspected, which was that if everything I create for YouTube or, or wherever these things end up over the long, long term, if it always has to be sort of my top grade quality then that's going to reduce the amount of material that I put out. So I knew that I needed to develop probably, or I should say I surmised that I needed to develop probably at the very top three levels, three grade levels, thinking grade in terms of like grade A beef, you know, like some meats really high end and expensive and worth the money and some falls in the middle and, you know, some you make hot dogs with. So I knew it would be smart for me to develop and be able to work inside of a few different looks. One was that high polish, high gloss, like at every level, not just the lighting, not just the camera, not just the writing, and, but the, all of it, the editing, the sound design, um, just every little piece would be kind of, there's a grade A. Then I knew I needed something a little less intense in terms of production because it's pretty much me right now it's only me (laughs) i don't want to cut myself short there i i look forward to a day when if this if this did become a viable way for me to make income maybe i have a team helping me make it but for now it's just me and i'm okay with that 
So I wanted a middle ground that kind of touches on the polished, but is allowed to be a little more loose and easy. So you see some of the studio stuff where I cut away then to cell phone footage, for example. Um, there are lots of cameras on the market, lots of different options for cameras that you know I can use both in studio or out in the field, as we say. And I have just found that you know the newer iPhone, the I have a 12 Max Pro, um, but the 13 certainly, and even ones below the 12, they have just some really great optics. They've got really great footage that they can shoot. I've seen professional crews using them. Uh, I've used these tools myself. Uh, of course, I'm saying I'm using it for YouTube some, but I, I even used uh, you know some phone footage in my my film, my documentary film. Not tons, but some. Uh, and what you'll find is what I found is, especially in a piece like that, you know, um, as long as you bring some quality occasionally, people know that you're competent and can do that. From there there's a tremendous amount of grace that your audience is going to give you to allow you to really use anything you have on you at the time just so long as we all agree and know that you do know what quality is and occasionally you send me some of that if you honor that and you're able to achieve a level of quality this is just an inside story tip for those of you who want to create and tell your own stories if you're able to establish a level of quality that that you and your audience both agree is is good um, you don't necessarily have to stay there the whole time I mean my my film for example has quite frankly it's got um, videos that were shot from a flip phone in it or something similar to that like really crappy uh, video that would have been even smaller than um, you know at the time you know NTSC four by three standard definition television which was already that's you know by com by today's standards that's a small little box in a big in a big frame if you're looking at like 4k for example and you drop a, a standard def TV image in there it's very small and so I, I put those in the film and I had to blow them up and I I did things like added uh, like sharp high resolution scan lines over the top to to sort of on top like as an overlay to the crappy footage you've got a little bit of a, a hint of crispness coming from the line grid so it tricks the brain into feeling like uh, you know this is high quality so anyway you know i had i knew i needed several levels and so this look right here is maybe my low end level perfectionism i'm i've been kind of revisiting this book bird by bird by anne lamott and she has this whole chapter on perfectionism right here and she says perfectionism it is the main obstacle between you and a shitty first draft oh man what a good book if you haven't read this book or if you have and it's been a while go back to it it's so good and it's good for people who want to write who fancy themselves to be or want to be a writer then absolutely you have to have this book don't just read it own it um but it, it really has just and this isn't really surprising to me but uh, a lot of the same things that make for great writing make make uh for good rules for living i believe probably one of the purest um and most beautiful and impressive art forms is writing um, of all different kinds uh, I don't mean one particular kind of or, or another but using language human language to to construct and explore worlds um, w whether through fiction or nonfiction um, to me I, I, I just think the, the the ability of the human brain to onboard something like language, for example, and then to be able to use that psychological tool of language to craft visions and ideas and experiences that, quite frankly, the human mind needs in order to understand its own dimensions, in order to understand um, what it's capable of or, or what maybe it shouldn't do or what what risks are involved in taking certain I mean just like learning right just learning this thing I'm recording right now I think I'm gonna release it 
because I think it's actually, in a way, really crappy. And that's part of what I want to be able to say that I can do. I need to be able to say that for myself. Perfectionism is the main obstacle between you and a shitty first draft. I'll close with this thing that I, I picked up when I was working on the film, which ties right into that, that quote from Anne. Along the way of working on my film, when we, when we launched the project in the very beginning, this was back in 2014, we started a Kickstarter. And we said to our, you know, um, to our potential supporters and our supporters that the goal was that the film would be done within a year of that Kickstarter. So, you know, we were in 2014, we were saying that roughly a year later, uh, in 2015, the film would be done. The film took six years of work to get done and there are all kinds of reasons for that and I'm I'm actually more than happy to talk about that but as I'm running a little long on this one I'll do that later but for now uh, suffice it to say that in the period of, of six years or so that it took to make the film there was a lot of uh, me actually healing from trauma was going on um, and so it was really kind of a back and forth process of work on the film, stop, work on yourself. Sit with that, maybe work on yourself some more, make a few tweaks. Oh yeah, work on the film a little bit. And it was just kind of, it was never the two things happening at the exact same time. There was real juggling happening that while one ball was in hand for a moment, all the others weren't. And that was just a constant interchange. It was a constant exchange. And... If you've seen the film, you know that I talk about one of my uh, personal challenges. Um, one of the things that was a result of early childhood trauma that turned into just sort of more of a, a day-to-day adult um, dysfunction that I had was I, I really didn't have the ability to love myself deeply. I was really, really in need of external affirmation. If I wasn't able to get that, I would not feel affirmed. I would not feel loved. I couldn't like myself. I couldn't be okay just because I was okay. There was none of that was was possible for me. This was true about me until I was able to face it and heal it. And that happened while I was working on the film, not before I started. So when I started, I started with the problem of needing that affirmation, needing to be loved, which meant I started with the peculiar but big problem of I need other people to like this film or I won't be able to release it. I won't be able to let go of it. That was a deal-killing problem that I had. because I was fully stuck inside of it, but fully committed to finishing this project, which necessarily, because we're talking about trauma, was going to show the world a less than awesome picture of me. And I don't know if you're tracking with me here, but for somebody who needs other people to love them, putting out a less than awesome picture of yourself is not how you do that, not intuitively anyway. The idea is to look lovable, to look great on some level and so i i got stuck and of course as i've mentioned i've actually dealt with this issue for myself and i've healed and i and i am doing this now because i've learned to ultimately i need to do these things to express myself whether you like it or not if you whoever you are see this and you like it and you'll watch it and if you don't you won't and if you if you're a certain kind of person who doesn't like it, you'll say something about how much you don't like it in a cruel or unkind comment, whatever. Uh, and some of you who like it or like it a lot will say kind things in comments. Fine. The thing I had to learn while I was still very much stuck in needing the approval of others, I had a moment of realization, which is reflected in just that little quote from Anne on perfectionism that it is the main obstacle between you and a shitty first draft. I had actually not read this yet when it occurred to me that professionally, of all the different jobs I've worked in television and film, one of the main things that people have hired me to do is to edit, which editing typically comes 
it's a later stage of a production and in my case a lot of the editing that I do is not editing of a fully scripted narrative a lot of the editing comes from like TV programs reality TV and not the really highly produced ones where the editor literally gets a pre-edited script and they just have to put stuff together but the stuff I would work on would be more like piles of raw interviews and I'm supposed to just watch through them all listen for the stories and make narratives come forward um, that is what I've done so much of for hire. So it occurred to me while working on the film, look, the problem I was having was I wasn't making anything sometimes because I needed it to be perfect the second it hit the page or the screen or whatever, the canvas. I needed I didn't want to output shit. I didn't want to output garbage. I wanted to output feature film. I, and I needed everything that came out of me between the time it left me and the time it hit the canvas, I needed it to either already be or somehow become the quality of a finished feature film. So that smack, when it hits that canvas, that part of the film is done, it's done. And the thing I had to realize and the thing I had to set myself free with is, Luke, people actually don't hire you ever to nail it on your first swing, to nail it on your first try. In fact, you have a very particular kind of job where it's given to you as raw material it's given to you in lump chunk form it's given to you so that you can refine it sharpen it process it and return it as feature film so to speak as quality that's what you do with everybody else's material why not just say to yourself, one side of yourself says, okay, me, hey, listen up over there. I'm about to start lobbing garbage at you because I know that what you've been doing almost to the point where you've got a robotic memory for it for the last God knows how long is you've been taking raw materials and processing them down into quality finished works. So I realized in the process of working on my film that I actually did not need to worry at that moment on creating a finished film. The first job was I needed to worry about creating a bad film. I needed to, I needed to get out of my way and allow myself to lay down either garbage, total garbage, or at the very least, extremely clumsy attempts at quality. I had to say, and, and then, once I did that, then that part of me, which was allowed to act like a crazy person and actually produce imperfect things, that part of me goes and shakes it off. Oh my God, I can't believe I had to do that. Uh, you know, And it goes and gets sprayed off with the fire hose or whatever while the more competent more poised, more practiced part of me stepped forward and said, okay, I deal with other people's messes, narrative messes all the time. Now let me just take some time and work with this narrative mess. Never mind that it actually came out of me. Uh, that part of me is out of the room and I'm not going to shame him. Uh, what I have here is a workable mess. Perfectionism is the main obstacle between you and a shitty first draft and a motorcycle out the window contributing to how shitty that draft is and a dog barking. Work on two sides of yourself as a creator. Work on the side of yourself that knows how to work to make a bad thing better. So, so spend a lot of time getting good at making bad things better. Other people's bad things or bad things that you find or bad things that you know maybe in theory you might one day make of course you won't ever because you're only going to make great stuff but work on a side of yourself that can take rough things and turn them into polished beautiful things and then also work on another side of yourself and that side of yourself it knows how to just spit stuff out you have to trust 
the 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 gap that exists between these two parts of yourself there's the part of you that's going to go ahead and turn in garbage but garbage is something and the refiner can work with something but never with nothing the refiner is never going to produce any content from scratch because the refiner lives to refine things down to their perfection. The refiner part of you cannot be expected to deliver any garbage. So draw a boundary, draw a line, and put the refiner over here, and then carve out a space for the producer, for the part of you that is not afraid to speak up, that is not afraid to share, and then let them just dump onto the page or the canvas or wherever you're at then take a breath give yourself whatever the space you need to keep those two colors from mixing together those two creatures from becoming intertwined let them be separate from one another and then when you're ready bring the refiner in the editor the processor and make it what it needs to be and take the time and and use the resources and all of that. Set bars for yourself that seem reasonable. This is me in practice showing you a very low bar of quality. I'm making myself do this. I don't like doing this. I don't want to do I wished that everything around me looked like highly produced and polished. This is my bat cave. I've got an almost rotting orange here wait it had a companion which is an actually rotting orange and I threw it this is as raw as it gets and embarrassingly so and I'm gonna be okay with that and I'm not even gonna do a lot of refining and processing right so this is my bar my measure where I can say, I want to free flow, I want to think, I want to share that process. So if you've made it this far, about 30 minutes of this, unbelievable. Uh, I want to know if this is useful, what would make it better. The thing I realized waking up in bed was that I've got to stop thinking that the point is to make something you want me to make because then I'm stuck guessing what you want I need to do more like Henry Ford where you know he said something along the lines of you know if I asked my customer what they wanted they would have asked for more horses or something like that like he knew about what a car was going to be before no one before anyone else could conceive of what that was they wouldn't have asked for it because it didn't exist so to some degree, I want to know what you think because I don't want these things to be painful because if they're painful, no one's going to watch them at all, not even my own kids. But beyond that, I also have to just learn that in this mode, whatever this ends up finally looking like, I've got to be willing to let that first character, the producer, produce knowing full well that the refiner is not going to be allowed to do much refining some chopping out you know horrible things like a car crashing through the window back there but you know other well no, why would i chop that out so there it is this is a a desktop rambling i don't even know what to call this this is how unproduced this is this is how not ready for this i am and yet i'm doing it so I look forward to some feedback and some input. Part of the reason I'm going to be okay letting this out is because I have to believe that I'm going to have hundreds of videos, not tens of videos. If this is one video among tens, then it might get deleted because I can do better than that. But if it's one of hundreds, potentially one day, then it's okay for some of them to be just a little more like this. So thank you for watching. And my, my dog's barking, which is code for me to go make sure that I am not under attack. So thanks again for watching, and I hope you all...
Have a great day. If you found this video to be useful and you like what I'm doing on YouTube, please would you mind subscribing to the channel, hit the bell button so you're alerted anytime I post new content, like the video, comment on the video, leave questions, and please share these videos. Share them anywhere you think people may run into them and find them to be encouraging or helpful in some way. Until I see you again, remember be safe, stay curious, give grace, make love, and be truly alive. Thanks for watching. Thank you.